So um, the, it's an ED study today uh, about trauma, trauma in children. And uh, I think, you know, most of the trauma topics have been co covered really well. And I actually think, if anything, children's ED are very good uh, with the pediatric trauma in terms of, you know, diagnosis, uh, referral process, management of uh, simple injuries at the front door. I think one of the issues I have found, actually, that is difficult, and it's because once, you know, you go from, you know, uh, a generalist view to having to deal with specific conditions that exist within a speciality it is very difficult for the generalist and I think it's very easy for me to say well actually you know oh, that's obvious or this diagnosis is obvious but that's because I exist within a very specialized niche so the purpose of today's talk is where can we where can we kind of get sidelined by trauma but potentially miss something else uh, so we're gonna have a talk and, uh, and I've done it as a series of questions uh, and then uh, once we've done the talk if we have time we'll go through some cases okay so I delivered this talk first at Sheffield Children's Hospital and the talk was set for uh, at the level of the FY1s who were coming in uh, because they were seeing these kids in ED uh, often in the first instance so it was really you know when you are there on the front line and you're seeing triaging children or assessing them uh, you know what things should you have in mind uh, so life on the front line for yourselves is difficult, and we're not going to go into the minutiae of orthopedic diagnoses, classification systems, complex treatments. The purpose of today's talk is that we think about, you know, patients who present. How do they present? Um, and how do we how do we make practical decisions uh, that are appropriate, uh, knowing that, you know, you have a lot of patients to see. Um, you can't investigate everyone. Um, so what we need to do is, is, is work out what is, what is safe practice and what things, uh, what things should we try not to miss, uh, accepting the fact that no one's perfect, uh, not least myself. So it's uh, assessment of limping children is very important because it encompasses everything from, uh, you know, a simple splinter in the toe uh, to a child who's got a Ewing sarcoma uh, and a terminal diagnosis. Um, one thing I've found is, is that children are very robust and children just want to play because that is their occupation. They just want to play. And it's always worthwhile taking parents' concerns seriously because the parent will see their child over like, you know, many days and see how their symptoms evolve. Whereas when we see these children, we'll just have a snapshot. So it's very important to take the parents, you know, uh, concerns um, and elucidate points in the history with them. And the aim is, is you have to make a diagnosis. When you see a child uh, who's had a, like a fall, they said, oh, there's got a fall and then he's got a bit of a limp or some pain, is that we have to make a diagnosis. Um, that, is, that is what we have to do. And we have to start from the top and go right the way down to the bottom and think of everything. So first question is, what is a limp? Uh, and we have a limping child pathway, uh, but essentially a limp is any distortion of walking so generally, we develop a reciprocating symmetric gait by the age of seven. So that's an adult type gait where every stride length is the same and our feet point forwards uh, and it looks very, every gait cycle looks like the one preceding it. Whereas before that age, a lot of children, they tend to waddle, they want to skip, they want to run. Um, so it's very hard to put an exact definition, but what we're looking at is any type of asymmetry and it could be due to pain, it could be due to weakness or it may be due to deformity. Um, so those are all the things that can actually distort gait and we have to think about. So when we see a child who's been referred, you know, and usually it's some simple trauma, they've fallen down uh, a few days ago uh, at school and now mum has noticed a few days later the child is a limp, you know, how concerning is it? You know, when we see these children, is this something where we can think, well, actually, most likely to be benign they, you know, it's unlikely to be anything serious. Um, these are all the diagnoses for limp when you open up a pediatric orthopedic textbook. And there are a lot here. Now, we don't need to know all of this list. And the vast majority of this list, they are uh, not... The screen's not moved on. Oh, right. Oh, OK. Is it moving now? It is now, yeah. Sorry. Oh, that's OK. I've been moving it on the other screen. <laughs> Sorry, I will... Uh, it's not very good, is it? It's OK. Um, is it so that would have been a really if you move on to the one with a list of things that's cool yeah that would be like a one slide presentation um so as we said about how it's asymmetrical movement of the limb so you don't have to when you write in the notes and you say i've seen this child with a limp you don't really have to characterize it any further for the for for the notes you just have to say you know the child is visibly limping and i think it's this side which looks abnormal compared to the other side so when it comes to being concerned about a child with a limp we talked about lots of diagnoses so um Anything from very benign things 
uh, that are self-limiting uh, to very uh, serious life-threatening things like infections or tumors. So when we look at the list of causes in, of LIMP, so uh, this is uh, some data compiled uh, from 60 children uh, who, who presented uh, with a LIMP, uh, trauma is there. Uh, but you can see that septic arthritis infection is almost equivalent uh, to the number of the patients who present with trauma, as is osteomyelitis. So what we can almost expect is, is that a lot of these children will have infections. 60 is by no means a representative sample, of course, but this slide is there to show that, you know, across a cohort of patients presented with limp, there could be infection, there could be inflammatory arthritis um, or trauma. So first thing we should think about when we assess these children is the age because age is important when it comes to causes. So this next uh, diagrammatic shows the various presentations and there's lots of different things going on here, but I think the important thing to note is, is that generally children who are young under the age of about five, if they have a limp, you have to be concerned it's septic arthritis, much more so than trauma, either septic arthritis or osteomyelitis. So septic arthritis is an infection in a joint. So where the joint capsule is full of pus, and then osteomyelitis is where there is infection within the bone. Perthes disease is a hip condition, which uh, may have been spoken about earlier, um, as is Sufi, and they have specific presentations. So Perthes typically presents around age four, but it could be anywhere from like two to 16. And a Sufi, where you have a slipped epiphysis, is usually in an adolescent. So there's only a few things here. If you think about infection, Perthes, slipped epiphysis, you get an idea of where these children lie in this age range. So I always think this with any presentation I see in clinic, I think, what is the worst thing that this child could have? Um, so these, what we're thinking is fracture. We don't want to miss that. And usually that's, that's probably the easiest one to diagnose because there's a definite history of trauma. There's usually deformity and investigations are reliable. You know, you do an x-ray and you will detect it most of the time. Infection is a bit more obscure in the sense that there is no gold standard investigation for in infection. I mean, obviously we can have blood tests, we can have MRI, ultrasound, lots of imaging, we can have blood cultures, uh, but there is no single one test. And every essentially it's, it's a cumulative assessment of a lot of different things. Tumors are worrying, but thankfully very rare. But tumors and infections and also fractures, all of these to a certain extent, timing of diagnosis has a massive bearing on outcome. And that's the important thing that we have to know about, you know, these scary conditions is the sooner we diagnose them, the more likely we are to have a better outcome. Um, so tumor and neurological involvement, which also is quite rare. Um, so that, okay. So the other thing we often have to think about in this day and age, especially when you, you know, when you're a junior doctor and you are seeing cases and you may have to make independent decision making uh, in, in a certain instance, it's, it's actually a bit worrying because you're thinking, you know, is this, is this something that could cause me issues, uh, you know, if, if I miss something uh, in terms of negligence. And, and it's important to know that the leading causes in pediatric orthopedics, it's, you, it's fractures around the elbow, how they're managed, not necessarily, not really how they're diagnosed in ED. It's more the orthopedic management of elbow fractures and whether it's appropriate. Um, but the other main cause of medical litigation is hip conditions being missed. So kids turning up to ED, being assessed and an X-ray wasn't done. The diagnosis uh, was made on a subsequent visit. There was a delay to treatment. And then, there, then there's a whole question asked about what was the impact of the delay on treatment. So I think this is another thing to be aware of. Um, when we assess these children, what are the important points? So usually children who have a limp, or most children indeed who present with a musculoskeletal complaint, there will be a history of trauma, more than likely that the parents will provide. Um, and often it's incidental. And that's why I've highlighted this in red, is the worrying thing is, is you know, the child will be limping or their arm will be painful and you'll say, oh, and you know, they, they haven't fallen. And children fall over all the time. And parents will say, do you know what? He was on the sofa a few days ago and he fell off um, and maybe that's it. So what I would suggest is, is that we don't get sidelined by that. And we actually think, well, okay, it could be that, but what else could it be? So usually there is a history of pain we should always think about systemic upset because systemic upset will go with the scary diagnoses of infection and tumor. You know, it's, it's very rare that you have a serious musculoskeletal infection in a child who is completely well. 
Uh, and similarly with a tumor, it's very rare that you have a presentation early on in the disease process. It would usually be after they've had symptoms for some time and there'll be a history of weight loss, uh, night pain, the child being generally unwell. Onset is important uh, because if, if they can't give you the onset specifically, but there has been a history of incidental trauma, it does cast doubt. It does cast doubt as to actually, you know, could there have been symptoms preceding the trauma? And that's always a good question to ask. Looking at the type of limp, you know, there are lots of different ways we characterize limp. Is it antalgic? Is there a Trendelenburg gait? But generally, you know, parents will say, my child is either looks like they're in pain when they're limping or they're not in pain. So I think it's very important to distinguish a painful from a pain-free limp. And what we shouldn't do is we shouldn't ignore the pain-free limp, okay? So can the problem be localized? Often children have amorphous symptoms, but occasionally they will localize their pain wrongly. And that's the other important thing is, is patients may complain of pain in, for instance, their knee, but the problem may be elsewhere, okay? Chronicity of symptoms, often parents won't come with a one hour history of limp following trauma. It will be like, there's a trauma a couple of days ago and the child has been limping. Question is, have they got better? Did they have this a few months ago? You know, how long has it been going on overall? And that also will give some ideas as to, as to the diagnosis. So in the assessment, if we go on red flag conditions, if we think, okay, what are the worst things it could be? And let's direct our questioning along those lines. So, you know, if it is a, we're pretty good at detecting trauma. So if there's a fracture and there's a definite trauma and then the symptoms and pain and limp came after that, you know, it's, it's usually very easy to elucidate the history of what the mechanism of trauma was um, and, you know, other potential injuries. But one thing we shouldn't miss with children, and I think ED is very, very good at this, uh, probably because you have more exposure um, uh, and, and training for, for detecting NAI uh, because you're on the front line. So, but NAI is something you should always have in the back of your mind. When we think about the red flag conditions of infection tumor neurology, if you ask the right questions, you will get answers that raise your suspicion. So, you know, always worth asking about, has this child been systemically unwell, had a fever, temperature, cough, cold recently? So we talk about potential portal systems for infection. So, you know, it can come from your chest, it can come from your urinary tract, it can come from your gut. So all those questions are, are very good, you know, outside of, you know, what is, you know, where, where, which limb is the painful um, and what was the history of trauma? So tumor, I generally ask a few questions, which is any previous history of tumor or treatment for tumor? Is there any weight loss? And is there any, anything to indicate non-mechanical pain? So this is a child who has pain at night, uh, they have pain at rest. They are never free of pain. And if you just if you ask those three things, you will pretty much be able to exclude it being a malignancy. Um, neurology you, usually is quite evident. So my next slide is: um, Are children good historians? Uh, they are not. They're not. Uh, and that's why uh, it's very very difficult for you know to to assess children after, you know, you know, with a limp and after minor trauma as we would an adult and be able to accurately correlate, you know, this innocent fall with where they are now. Um, so a lot of our history has to be directed towards the parents and what they've seen and observed. The children can really only speak for how they are at that point in the here and now. Uh, and the other problem I find that with children, especially when you assess, you know, when you're doing this history with the parents is uh, children fall over all the times. In fact, the, one of the leading presentations to my elective clinic is children under the age of four who are clumsy and frequently fall over. And now the problem with that sort of child is if something else goes wrong with him, one of these other conditions, when he presents to ED, almost certainly there will have been a history of fall in the recent past. Children also tend to cry a lot and you don't know if they're crying because they're distressed to see you um, or they're, they're crying because they're distressed and they're in pain or whether it's an unfamiliar setting. So that's another element which makes assessment difficult. They also like to run around. They like to run around with a limp uh, and be very active and really uh, often not feel sorry for themselves in the same way that an adult would, um, you know, with a, with a significant complaint. The issue also is, is, do they have a temperature? I find that most children are generally quite hot, you know, from all their running around and their activity. Um, and therefore, I th it is always worthwhile you know, formally checking temperature in children and then maybe rechecking it if you have any doubt. The other issue is, is, you know, compliance with a conventional examination or especially with the younger children. And what that means for me is practically is a greater reliance on investigations in children 
who are quite young get easily distressed where I find actually my examination really isn't yielding much. So how do we assess gait? Um, so just by watching really, essentially when you watch you know, a child walk, you just see that they're symmetrical um, and you know, uh, try to get them to not skip or run. Make sure their feet are pointing the right way. Uh, see if there's a waddle. So this picture at the top right shows what we call a Trendelenburg gait. And the reason this happens is multitude and trying to explain it in terms of what happens around the muscles of the hips uh, is also quite complex. So I think the easiest thing to understand about Trendelenburg gait is it's a bit of a Marilyn Monroe waddling gait. And it's usually pain free. And it usually indicates a hip condition in a child. The hip may be dislocated. The hip may have, you know, uh, had some issue where it's uh, caused shortening uh, and deformity uh, and that's causing the muscles to be ineffective and causing this gait. Um, so the important thing is, is to have a look at the gait and not be distracted by the fact that the child is giggling or happy. The bottom right uh, picture shows uh, the Gowers test and I always do uh, a Gowers test uh, wherever I suspect that there's any neurological involvement because although we're talking about limp and you know the limping child pathway what you have to remember is sometimes with young children you may have a child who presents who is not able to walk at all um, but you shouldn't think well actually they cannot walk and therefore they are not a limping child i follow the exact same protocol as if they are a limping child as in what could it be because you know if they have a serious infection or a slipped up femoral epiphysis uh, or neurological involvement they will not walk so lack of gait uh, you know is is just as important as as a limp so what examinations do we need to carry out? You know, which systems should be involved? Do we just need to like look at the leg and move the leg? Um, well, when we look at the origin of limb from that 60 patient cohort, we can see that all of the joints in the lower limb can be involved. And then if we take neurology into account, uh, we're also thinking about involvement of the spine. So this is where we really can't hone down and think about just one location. And I think that's one of the other that's one of the problems with the innocent trauma is the innocent trauma or the child clutching their knee has a tendency for us to focus on on one part. Um, and we may miss something else entirely. So when I examine so these children, the lower limb, um, what we want to do is in each of the joints, so the hip, the knee and the ankle, we want to see is there any warmth or tenderness or swelling. And the easiest way is, is to just have a feel, just have a feel of the joint and look at the child's face and see if he tolerates you feeling it. And just wiggling it and if it's irritable they you know they won't allow you to do that the knee and the ankle are easy because they're very superficial joints so swelling and erythema and signs of infection are very obvious the hip is a very deep joint and therefore physical signs may not be readily apparent what you need to do with the hip is is assess their range of movement and the way to do this is with the child positioned prone. So if you see the picture here, the photograph with the child lying down. So you lie the child down and you keep the knee, knees roughly together and you allow the feet to drop out. And what you can see in this image is that the right foot is not flopping out as much as the left. And almost certainly with this restriction comes discomfort at the extremes. So as the right foot, you're trying to allow it to flop out as much as the left, the child will be uncomfortable and they will resist you doing it. And sometimes the signs of the reduction of motion in the hip joint are as subtle as just that. You know, if you ask the child to kick, he can kick. If you ask the child to squat, he can squat. If you move the hip around, they will move the hip around. But if you lie them prone and you compare the rotation of the hip, as we do here, put the knees together, let the feet flop out, you'll find that there's a definite asymmetry and discomfort. So this is the way to examine the hip. And I think this is probably the most crucial part of the exam. Which brings me nicely on to my next point is children often have knee pain. They often complain of knee pain and they're seen and they have an examination of the knee and they even have x-rays of the knee and they're absolutely fine. But the problem is not in the knee. So where is the problem? Often it is the hip. So why does this happen? The, re the reason this happens, we see this in children, is because the obturator nerve um, it supplies both the hip joint and the knee joint. And they're likely to be, you know, parts of the nerve which subserve both joints. Now, when we look at the somatotopic representation of sensation uh, in, in the cortex, uh, you can see that, um, you know, the leg and the hip are not really represented too well. You know, it's only that small bit of cortex. And I think that is the issue that in a child where the limb, you know, the limb 
the limb to trunk ratio in a child is much less than in an adult. Um, and that is probably why the somatotopic representation is confused in children, but not so much adults. In adults, you will not often find there's a problem in the hip and they complain of knee pain. It does happen, but in children, it is by far the norm rather than the exception. So often you'll find this child gets investigated for their knees, they have x-rays, nothing comes out. Eventually the hip is examined, there's loss of internal rotation as we discussed on the previous slide. You do an x-ray and you see that there's a slipped up femoral epiphysis. So always think knee pain in a child, I have to rule out the hip. Cardinal message. So infection, what if we suspect there's infection? What do we do? So Cocker is an orthopedic surgeon who wrote this landmark paper in 19, um, six, 1999, where he looked at uh, what are the cardinal features? Because he, he found that a lot of these children with infections in a hip, which is quite an unreachable joint, they, have, uh, they may have had a history of antibiotic use, they may have had a cough or a cold, they may have a limp, um, they may have altered blood tests, they may have a temperature. So he looked at all the various factors and he distilled them down to a, um, a predictive uh, algorithm of these four elements. So is the child weight bearing? Do they have a temperature greater than 38 degrees? Is the white cell count elevated over 12? And he originally looked at the ESR over 40. Subsequent studies have looked at the CRP because that's more commonly used. So is the CRP elevated is the, is the fourth thing. And what he found is that as you recruit, as you have more of these four, criteria and although I've put one out of four next to non-weight bearing it can be any of the four as you go from two out of four to three out of four you jump to over 90 percent so when you assess a child and you're thinking actually you know what it could be you know they've got a limp and there is some incidental trauma but I think it could be infection because the child has had a bit of a cough or a cold the temperature's a bit raised in ED mum says he's just not well so what we do here is is we think okay we've checked the temperature let's do some blood tests and let's work out what is our index of suspicion. Um, and generally at this point, I would suggest that a referral to orthopedics um, is useful uh, if you suspect there is infection. Um, so where can infections be in children? You know, how do they get there? So children are very prone to infections in their joints. And the reason why children are very prone, sadly, to infections in their joints compared to adults is because of uh, their anatomy. So when we look at this, so uh, this shows a long bone, with a, uh, a growth plate and the epiphysis. And the growth plate is a barrier to the blood vessels going into the epiphysis. So unfortunately, the blood vessels, as they travel up from the shaft into the flared end of the bone, but they can't quite cross into the epiphysis, they make these killer turns. So you can see these killer turns. And the problem with killer turns is, uh, like anything in terms of drainage, they cause turbulence. And so if you have any bacteria flowing around in your body, it could be from like, um, you know, very mild, uh, bacterial infection from your urine uh, or uh, your gut or anywhere for that matter, those bacteria, they swim around your bloodstream, they will sediment in the, you know, in these flared ends of your bones where you have these killer turns and they cause an infection. And on the image on the left, you can see the infection builds up adjacent to the growth plate. And as it builds up in, within the bone, it has two possibilities. If the neighboring capsule it attaches further away to allow the infection to rupture into the joint, it may do. So some ends of the bones, and we're thinking hip and around the knee, the actual flared end of the bone is within the joint. So if pus ruptures out, it will go straight into the joint and cause a septic arthritis. So that's how we get a septic arthritis. There doesn't have to be a history of penet penetrating trauma, you know, like an, an injury, direct injury or something going into the knee. Children, if they have bacteria, for whatever reason, floating around in their bloodstream, you know, they can deposit in the metaphyses, form an osteomyelitis, and that ruptures into the joint. And that's the typical way you develop septic arthritis. If you look at the image on the right, sometimes the infection remains localized within the shaft of the bone. And instead of rupturing into the capsule, it may just rupture into the adjacent soft tissues around the bone and cause a soft tissue abscess. So how do we diagnose infection? Sadly, I think x-rays are not great during the early stages. So on the right here, you can see that there is a, you know, an x-ray of the knee and there's an obvious arrow pointing to um, you know, a lytic lesion within the bone that is a Brody's abscess. So it's within the flared area of the bone. As we said, some bacteria has escaped those killer turns in the blood vessels and they've created a localized collection. And this would have had to have been there for many weeks for us to see this x-ray appearance. So an x-ray is very good 
where you think, well, actually, there's an infection here. I want to do a basic investigation to rule out osteomyelitis that is within the bone. But I know that an X-ray, a normal X-ray alone, cannot exclude an early infection. You know, I may very well have a normal X-ray where there's infection within the bone that's escaped into the capsule and causes septic arthritis. So that is why an X-ray is not completely diagnostic, but we will always do one when we suspect infection because it's a good first line investigation. Ultrasound is useful, especially around the hip because it's a deep joint, but I find that it's not a helpful investigation uh, because here you can see at the bottom right, there's this green line showing the capsule elevated off the bone, whereas this image uh, to the right of it, you can see there's no elevation. And all this tells us is there's fluid around the hip. It could just be a bit of an irritable hip. It could be an inflammatory arthritis. It could be infection. We don't really know from this alone. And also the other problem with the ultrasound is we may look at this and think, oh, there's just fluid around the hip. And that's the problem when what we don't see is that there's osteomyelitis throughout this femur. So for me, the gold standard investigation is an MRI. So I will always request an MRI. Bearing that in mind, I think what that suggests to us is really when we start to think about infection, I think we have to consider an er early referral to orthopedics because there is no good universal investigation. We can do good screening tests in CED, but sometimes we may need an MRI to diagnose, for instance, an isolated soft tissue abscess, you know, around the hip. Uh, and therefore, if there is a spectrum of infection, I would advocate early referral. So common organisms, it's, you, it's the ones that we would expect at this age, and they are usually responsive to antibiotics. Some musculoskeletal infections, for instance, discitis, can be treated with antibiotics alone. But I would say that when it comes to infections within the limbs, they have to be treated seriously and antibiotics alone are not satisfactory. So that brings us to the next slide that could we just give them some antibiotics and see them the next day if we get a normal x-ray, uh, but the CRP may be slightly raised. I would definitely say no, because infections can cause severe sepsis, as we know, which can be life or limb threatening. Often children who have an infection in the hip, uh, which may be treated late, uh, go on to have severe damage to that hip joint very early on in life with pain and disability and a severe lack of reconstructive options. So this x-ray on the right shows, uh, you can see there's a normal hip there here, but on this side, the hip has been completely ravaged by infection. There is no joint there. Uh, and this child will have a, a limp and pain uh, from age you know, two onwards, really. Um, so time is critical. They need to be admitted, they need to be drained, they need intravenous antibiotics through a central line, they need to be monitored uh, with inflammatory markers. So infection is very serious. Always have that spectre of suspicion when you see a child with trauma who has some systemic upset. So other differentials for infection, transient synovitis is an irritable condition around the hip, we'll talk about it briefly, um, and it is quite common and it is benign, but it is a di diagnosis of exclusion. Similarly, inflammatory arthritis, where, you know, they may have like a, a seronegative type arthropathy uh, causing, you know, a knee swelling and pain. These, these diagnoses are ones you come to after you've extensively investigated for infection. They're not the diagnoses you reach for first. So almost anything that is a differential for infection is a secondary consideration. But once you go down that path, almost certainly you will come to a diagnosis as to whether it's, you know, uh, trauma from an occult fracture inflammatory arthritis or a tumor. And likely a lot of that distinction between say a funny looking abscess on an X-ray or a Ewing sarcoma, it won't be made in the ED setting. It may not even be made in as an orthopedic inpatient. It may be diagnosed from a biopsy in a clinic visit much later. So always go for infection, knowing that that investigation pathway will eventually come up with these other diagnoses. So transient sign of Otis, it is a, irritable condition of the hip we don't really understand could it be a subocult infection but essentially you have a child with a limp who's not systemically unwell and an ultrasound shows a bit of fluid around the hip now i will usually diagnose a transient synovitis by washing out a child's hip if i have a ch child who has fluid around the hip and is has a limp and inflammatory markers may be equivocal i would advocate an urgent mri and washing them out 
because until you go into the hip and you see what the fluid looks like and you've sent it off for culture, you really can't be sure, is this a transient synovitis or an infection? So I would really say that transient synovitis is a diagnosis that really orthopedics should make and it should be a senior orthopedic doctor and it should usually be made as a diagnosis of exclusion after you've definitively proved, often by surgical exploration, there's no infection. So suspecting a tumor, like I said, if you ask about red flag features, if you ask about night pain, weight loss, constitutional upset, previous history of tumor, you will, there will be features there to suggest it. And you've investigated along the lines of infection, you've done a plain x-ray, you've done the blood test, you find that there are raised inflammatory markers and the x-rays are abnormal. And by this time you are looking at a referral process. So you're pretty much there, you know, you have not kind of discounted it, you've investigated it, and now you hand it over to the relevant speciality. It's worthwhile being aware that, um, you know, acute lymphocytic leukemia, 25% of these patients will have musculoskeletal pain with musculoskeletal involvement. So, you know, even though primary bone tumors are quite rare, you know, leukemia often in children will come with a musculoskeletal presentation. But usually these children, when I've, I've seen them, if you take the history, you will see there's a lot of unusual things, you know, an unwell child over quite a long period with maybe aphthous ulceration in the mouth that the mum's gone to the GP, you know, recurrent mild trivial infections. Um, so the hist what this underpins is that I think if you have an index of suspicion and you have this discussion with parents, you will come to you know, a sensible idea as to whether you need to investigate. Primary bone tumors are very rare. You know, Ewing sarcomas, um, thankfully, you know, uh, we're looking at a couple of hundred presenting across the country a year. So there's three regional uh, bone tumor centers across the whole country, uh, which shows that they're not very obvious. Uh, and I think if you do x-rays and blood tests, you will diagnose these. I don't think you'll miss one. Um, and then obviously you'll refer to pediatric orthopedics or adult orthopedics accordingly. So we've talked about all those red flag conditions. So, you know, all infection, tumor, you know, neurological involvement. Those are quite obvious, you know, things that we'd like to think on the history uh, and our investigations. But often what we find is we've got a child, trivial trauma, a bit of a chronic limp, but otherwise completely systemically well. They're even smiling at you, you know, during the examination, running around and you document notes looking well and moving well. Um, and this is where we need to be aware of a couple of more esoteric pediatric orthopedic conditions um, that are not, you know, they don't readily present with uh, an unwell uh, child whose function may be very compromised. Uh, and the conditions we're talking about here are, are in the hip. And what is important from an ED perspective um, when it comes to, you know, these cases being reviewed and saying, actually, could anything have been done differently? Did it impact, did a late diagnosis impact on the care, you know, on this child's condition? And sadly, the answer for these conditions is yes. The answer is, is that the earlier you diagnose them, the better the outcome. So that's why we do have to be cognizant. And because they're not readily, you know, they don't present with a sick child, you have to know the condition to know what to look for rather than thinking, oh, I, I found something, I can see something in that child. Uh, let me go away and think, what could that be? So this is case one. It's an 11 year old boy and he's got um, a four week history of uh, left knee pain and he's got an antalgic gait and we lie him down and we see this uh, with the legs. And now that I think I've gone through all of this, you know, we're thinking it has to be something in the hip and he's in that age range. He's an older child coming into adolescence. So it's more likely to be a slipped up femoral epiphysis. Um, and he's got knee pain, which points to the hip. Uh, and there's a reduced range of motion of the hip. And all of that seems fairly obvious. But what we don't see when, you know, what, what this presentation doesn't highlight is this child has been walking throughout and they are systemically well. And if you ask them to like kick or walk or even run, they probably will be able to do it with this limp that they're, they're getting on with. So when we x-ray these, we see that there's often a mild slip, uh, and that is a slip that is usually in progress. Uh, so you, the quicker we catch it, the better it'll be. So slipped up femoral epiphysis, males more than females, um, and it's usually approaching adolescence. And the reason this is, is that the slip happens across the growth plate at the top of the femur. Uh, 
Why does this happen in your teenage years? Growth is very fast under the age of five. So like, you know, if you, when you have a look at, if you have a baby and, uh, and you look at pictures from a few months ago, you just think, oh my God, you know, in like six months, uh, my baby has doubled in size. Uh, and then you look at them at three years of age and you think, I can't believe this came out for person three years ago. But then after that, after four years of age, growth really slows down. But then it picks up again in adolescence. And that's when you go through that growth spurt. So when you look at girls and they get to like 12 or 13, they suddenly shoot up typically a year before boys. So you have this funny year at school um, as a boy where uh, girls are taller than you and you're thinking, oh, this is, you know, what's wrong with the world? And then fortunately the next year, uh, the boys growth spurt kicks in uh, and then they, uh, they shoot up a bit taller. But in that growth spurt period, this growth plate is producing a lot of cartilage that is then being replaced by bone. So as the growth plate thickens, it becomes an area of vulnerability. And typically adolescent kids are doing more sports, they're playing football after school. So it's unfortunately a perfect storm for an, an overweight kid, basically, you know, playing football, going through his growth spurt, having a bit of a slip, and then his hip, you know, falls off. Um, the issue with the slipped up femoral epiphysis is if you have a bad slip, then as this epiphysis comes off, it tears all the blood vessels, and over time that head dies. And then you've got a child who is 14, and they've got a degenerate hip, almost like they're an 80 year old with end stage arthritis. And their only real option is a hip replacement once they go into adulthood around age 16. So it is a diagnosis that has a severe manifestation. It's quite a rare diagnosis. We will only see in Leicester less than 10 a year. And most of those will be mild, only like maybe two or three will be severe slips. And that's with our catchment area of 1 million plus. So it is rare, but the problem is, is it is potentially devastating. And that's why it is right up there as like a leading cause of medical litigation. Because the question is always asked, well, this could have been diagnosed on x-ray, you know, should there, was there an appropriate index of suspicion? And it gets missed in all EDs. I'll highlight a case, uh, you know, which, um, you know, locally, uh, but, you know, this, this happens in every emergency department in the country. It isn't a reflection on, you know, individual clinicians or acumen. It's just the fact that it is very rare and its presentation is actually very subdued for a serious condition. Case two. So the next hip condition we'll talk about is five-year-old boy complaining of knee pain. And this is cyclical over several months and you find that they've got reduced internal rotation, but this child is well in between. And they are often, when you see this child in clinic, ED review clinic, or when they present to ED and mum says, I'm just not happy because it's been going on for many months, you'll see that, um, you know, the child looks pretty good and they're fine. And the only real way that you will diagnose this on clinical assessment is if you lie this child down on their front, you put their knees together, and what you'll notice is they have lost internal rotation on one side. It may be a bit tweaky, but there'll be a definite loss of internal rotation. If there's only one movement test you have to do for the hip, and that's the one you do, and you don't need to know any angles or reference ranges, you just look at what the other side can do. So the pain-free side, you look at how much that foot can flop out. So as with the Sufi, as with this, as with all the hip conditions, internal rotation is a very sensitive test, and it is the best test. Perthes disease is important because it also causes damage to the blood supply of this head over time and the head degenerates and you get a very misshapen head which degenerates early in adult life and they need a hip replacement so once again not a great diagnosis is timing important it is because it isn't always inexorable it's not that if you if you come to it and uh, you know you uh, you diagnose it early you can't do anything to save it you can do an operation to try to capture this head within the socket to stop it splurging out over time. But that operation is very time critical and it is very contentious as to when it might work. But if you miss the boat with this, you pretty much have to just watch this hip progress through to the end stage of being a flattened mushroom. So diagnosis here is pivotal, early diagnosis. Uh, case three, I think this is our last uh, hip condition, um, is a young girl and uh, who's you know a baby, probably just started walking, Pregnancy, everything is fairly unremarkable. Mum says baby was breech, um, but there were no concerns. Examination, all you find is the leg doesn't move as well as the other. So you do your internal rotation test. You know, you, if you, you try to lie the child, you know, on their, on their front, and then you find the child's crying. Doesn't want you to do anything. And then you're thinking, okay, what do I do? Can I move it on mum's lap? 
and you try to hold the legs and they're not letting you do anything and you can see that the legs moving and you're thinking gosh what do i do here i can't do mr qureshi's internal rotation hip test in this instance i just get an x-ray if you find that the child is too young to comply with an examination of the hip you know and you suspect something is wrong i would get an x-ray and the reason is is that in this child where mum may think one leg is a bit shorter than the other but the child is happy they waddle a bit when they walk you do an x-ray and what you find is the hip is dislocated it's gone it's out and you think how can this be is the child in pain they aren't what this is is a hip that has been dislocated from birth it has never been in and therefore the child has never been in pain and because children you know because they're cute you know disproportionate features and the legs are quite stubby even though the hip's dislocated the shortening is not readily apparent and the hip will still move it just won't move as well as the other one and it's very rare that a mum will notice when they change the nappies that actually that leg doesn't quite move like the other one because the restriction in movement is usually quite mild it's quite mild it's not it's not obviously marked and when this comes to light is when the child is around walking age and the child will walk with a dislocated hip. It's not that they won't walk. They'll be delayed by a month or two, but they will eventually walk. But when they walk, it will be obvious over time that something's wrong. They're giggling, but they're waddling and they're just waddling all the time. This is an important diagnosis to make because it is time critical in terms of outcome. So treating this surgically at age one is different to at age two, is different to at age three and different to at age four. And you might say, well, actually, I'm pretty sure this would get diagnosed early on, but I still see children, you know, who have never come to ED. They've been seen in primary care and they finally get an X-ray at age three or even age four. And then the hip is found to be out. So this is yet another, you know, these three hip conditions where findings may be quite occult, but in all three, they all share the fact that if you have the suspicion based on some examination findings, the X-ray will nail the diagnosis. You know, it will get it. So what do I do for these out of interest? It wouldn't be a pediatric orthopedic talk without, uh, you know, a bit of um, egocentric surgeon, gratuitous showing off x-rays. Uh, so you have to do a very big operation. So you take them to theater, you see the hips dislocated, then I have to effectively open up the whole hip, um, like, a, like a Lego architecture and take away all the Lego bits and then put them back together as they should be over three hours. So it's not just a sufficient to put this hip in. If you look at this x-ray, you can see that the roof on the normal hip is very horizontal, but the roof here is shooting up to the sky. The head is kind of almost damaged on the inner aspect because you know it's obviously been flattened against the side of the pelvis. And obviously the muscles and everything will be tight. So to just put it in alone isn't sufficient. I usually have to shorten the femur and rotate it so that it's pointing into the joint. But the nice thing about shortening the femur uh, to release, reduce the tension on the muscles is I get a solid wedge of bone and I put it to one side. And then what I do is I cut above the socket on the pelvis. So I cut all the way across and then I lever it down so that I can bring the roof over this head and try to recreate how it should be on the other side. And then the bone which came out of the femur gets wedged in here you know, like the stick in the crocodile's mouth uh, and it's held there and, and that keeps that roof down and fills in. So then what we hope is that this is how this child presented to me almost three years of age uh, with a funny walk, um, not seen in ED, uh, only in primary care. And you can see on the left, that's how the hip was before. And then one year after the surgery, we've put the hip in, the pelvic osteotomy, we've cut above the pelvis is filling in. Uh, there's a roof over that head. The head looks a bit more like the opposite side um, and the femur's healed as well. Uh, but this is a big operation and it has a really big complication profile and uh, not least on the consent form, there is a risk to life or limb. So the earlier this is diagnosed, perhaps the less you have to do and the more favorable the outcome. So developmental hip dysplasia, this is quite common, one in a thousand. A lot of them are picked up by neonatal ultrasound, um, but an equal number escape detection on screening after birth. Uh, and they present later with a child who has a limp and often presents to primary care, although sometimes they may come to ED if mum feels, you know, I'm not being taken seriously. An x-ray is all you need to make the diagnosis if you think that leg's a bit shorter or it doesn't quite look, you know, move the same and the child is like, got a waddle. I haven't talked about growing pains. Because, you know, that is one of the biggest things I see really is, you know, uh, a lot of time I get referrals, they say growing pains and could a growing pain cause a limp? You know, a child comes to clinic 
with a growing pain, could it be that? I would say definitely not. Growing pains are really common. They happen as kids grow because of tension on the attachments of tight muscles on bones that are like, you know, almost putting out an inch of bone overnight sometimes. But growing pains are very chronic and they are very mild and they're very diffuse. And usually it's both legs and it's symmetrical. And they have a very clear relationship with activity. So these children will have absolutely fine weekends where they're at home doing nothing, but when they return to school and they run around or they get taken to the playground afterwards, they're up at night crying because their legs hurt and they need to be massaged and they need some Calpol before going to bed. So you will not really see these children present to ED. It's never a severe enough clinical picture where a parent will think, do you know what, I'm going straight to ED for this. And growing pains never cause a limp, ever. I think I've laid it on pretty thick with like, you know, these life-threatening diagnoses and, everyone, you know, you're probably thinking, well, actually, Mr. Kreshi, we see a lot of limps. We see a lot of funny gates and, you know, they're not, most of them are innocent or they've improved before the child's come in or we do investigations. And a lot of the time we may not find a cause. And I would wholly agree with you. But I think the important thing is, is have an index of suspicion and always come to, always look for a diagnosis. You know, all those things that we've talked about in terms of red flag conditions and those three hip conditions, have them there in your mind and always think, could this presentation be one of those? There will be instances where it's a child with, uh, you know, a foreign body in the foot, you know, and because uh, it's a child who can't give a history like a two year old and no one's bothered to look at the foot. Uh, and then you see on this puncture mark on the sole and you get an X-ray. Uh, so it isn't always, you know, severe life or limb threatening conditions. I will make a very brief mention about troubled teenagers. I think all of us will appreciate that with lockdown and the effects of the pandemic, this is a group where, you know, we do see uh, the adolescent where they actually are troubled and it may manifest itself as, you know, musculoskeletal pain. And I see these in clinic and they are a very distinct minority. You know, and I really challenge my colleagues who say, oh, in pediatric orthopedics, what do you do with all these children who are dysfunctional or they've got this unusual uh, psychosocial model of pain? And I think, well, actually, no, most of them, if you do the investigations, their alignment will be off or there will be some issue that is causing their growing pain picture to be exacerbated. So I would say that, you know, if you've got a child who refuses to bend their knee, but is walking absolutely normally, exclude all the other things before you say, actually, I think this is a troubled teen. So, you know, there are troubled teens, uh, but it is quite rare that they'll present. Uh, and it's always a diagnosis after excluding everything else. So that is a summary. You know, it can be any and everything. Think about everything. And what you should always have in your mind when you have a child with a limp is, I have to make a diagnosis. I have to think, what is this? You know, the parents think it's serious. And, you know, I have to prove you know, I have to go out of my way to prove them wrong rather than just thinking, actually, it should be OK. Infection is time critical. That is a very important point. Always any doubt, refer early. Uh, you know, you shouldn't feel uh, I've you know, I've gone through orthopedic training and I know, you know, uh, there is a spectrum of practice uh, as to how uh, the interaction plays out when you make a referral. But you have to think of your safety. You have to think of your safety professionally and, you know, concern for the child. Um, and if anyone speaks to you inappropriately about referral, uh, please uh, let me know. Um, so I think that is it. And I've got some uh, cases, but I'm willing to take questions at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Asan. That was that was that was a great uh, uh, end end to the day. Um, I don't know, Damien. Do you have any questions or any thoughts or anything that you've noticed in the chat? Nope. My bomb. Oh, sorry. It's um. I said this, I've got one direct question. Um, it, it's really reassuring to me uh, that our um. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That basically, nearly ninety nine percent of what you said, I kind of completely agree with, and I, I love it when I go to other specialties presentations and there is a um com uh, complete. Uh, unanimity of ag agreement because it, it always uh, leads to healthy outcomes. The only thing that I, my ears picked up on was some of your comments on transient synovitis, which we do commonly diagnose in the ED and send home without sometimes blood tests and uh, sometimes without an orthopedic review. Mm -hmm. And I, I wondered if we could just bring that comment up again because I want to make sure that I'm not being divergent in my practice 
or that is there a pathway that we should be using that we're not? I think I, um, I, I think that's a really good point, Damien. And I think it was with that in mind, I've I've selected like I've got four cases I was going to present that are actually real cases that have like you know I've, I've got the ice records and i've got the details for um about what happens when a diagnosis of transient synovitis is made for instance and usually i think with transient synovitis what you've ruled out is systemic upset in the child that's what has been my experience is that you've said well actually you know there is a, a limp here but it is pain-free uh, and the child is systemically well there's no pyrexia there's no history of them being unwell they look well but they've got a limp and they're not in pain. And that's where that is that small bit. That is that small like space, you know, uh, within like the spectrum of presentations you see where you'll think, actually, you know what, can I call it a transit synovitis? And you can. And I think a lot of the time you will be fine. But I think a, a very small fraction of the time, it may be something that has been missed. And that isn't kind of like cast doubt over you know, ED's practice, because I think ultimately what we have to, what we have to appreciate is um, absolute victory in every patient is an untenable goal for ED everywhere, because that's the nature of diagnostics and that's the nature of logistics. And what we have to do is, is I think even the best protocols, so the, uh, the limping child protocol is very good. And I think if we follow that, we are robustly covered. So I think the limping child protocol i think you know if you come to that and you think well actually i've followed that uh, uh you know i think you're being safe uh, and it may be that by following that you come to a diagnosis where you think i think this is a transit synovitis but i think the important thing in that protocol will be the x-ray i think that is probably the take-home message and it will be seen from the cases that i think there's like four cases if you're happy for me to do the, it will be that actually the thing that changed everything is the x-ray you know you've got a well child uh, with a pain-free limp, um, you know, and uh, and he is moving his hip well. Can I discharge them? That question. And I think that's where I would suggest if you are going to, you, you can make the diagnosis of transit synovitis if you have an x-ray that is normal in a systemically well child. I don't know how you, what your feelings are about that, Damien, about that Possibly. x-rays on that patient population so i absolutely love uh uh complete victory in all ed patients is an untenable goal i'm going to use that in commissioning meetings as well i think that's a, <laughs> it's, it's a great way of uh, uh looking at, at the world um i think what i've taken from your talk is as, as well as the guideline and that telling you what to do it, it's it's worth putting any patient that you're discharging through a quick um, and for, for queer for feverish patients in sepsis, I call it the brought back dead test. And it, it's really morbid. But I think to myself, OK, if I'm discharging this patient now and they return tomorrow and they've arrested and died, what have I written in my notes or my way of thinking that confirms it was a reasonable de decision to discharge them? Um, and I suppose there's the the brought back with hip pathology test, which is, OK, this is this is my child. I've, I've documented this. I've thought of this. I'm going to do a. have uh, looked at the guideline. I'm, I'm going to do a final thing. Is there anything else here that, that I could be missing or just doesn't sit comfortably with me? Because there isn't, then you need to, to really think about uh, kind of other x-rays, other investigations. And I think some of your cases made that re point really well. Mm, yeah, uh, I, I think I really that way of thinking, Damien, I think is actually very good. Because we can't be all kind of like, you know, walking uh, repositories of knowledge of every condition. And I think almost sometimes I base my practice on exactly like you. I think, you know, I see a child in clinic. I think, gosh, what if it's a tumor? You know, every child who comes to me with like musculoskeletal pain, I always have in my mind, like, you know, what if it's a tumor? How can I be comfortable? Um, shall I quickly go through these cases, actually? Because I think they'll be useful to. Yeah, no, that sounds great. OK, um, so uh, case one. Uh, and these cases, these are from ED uh, that I've collected, not just from our ED. And I think that's an important point to say, actually, you know, uh, cases get, you know, this, uh, this is not specific to us. This is not a problem for us. There's not a problem for like Nottingham or Northampton. You know, cases do get missed. Um, and the important thing is that from those cases, we, we review them and we learn from them. So hopefully this will be a good condensation of learning points. So 11-year-old girl, she presents to ED 
she likes Doritos, you know, and uh, she tripped over a doorstop two days ago. And she's been unable to uh, extend or weight bear on her right knee. And, you know, her right knee is painful and no other ED attendance in the last two years. So that's what we find. So pain in the knee, can't fully extend the knee. What we have to be mindful here is, is that limb movements are composite. So typically when we extend our knee, we will move our hip. And our hip, as we extend our knee, our hip usually goes from flexion to extension. And that's another thing where we should always think of knee pain and movement in the knee precipitating pain. It may be because the composite movement of that limb is causing the hip to move at the same time the knee is moving and the somatotopic representation in the brain is still localizing that to the knee. So x-rays were done in this child, no fracture demonstrated, all looks good. And outcome, cricket pad splint crutches, referred to fracture clinic, okie doke. Three days later, patient pitches up again to ED and she's like, mum's like, she's in uncontrollable pain. And they look at the history. She's still got knee pain. She's had the x-rays of the knee. The knee, the x-rays were fine. They have a look at them again. And they think, okay, well, you know, she, she has been referred to fracture clinic, but we'll send it. We think she's systemically well. We'll send her home and we'll catch up with her in ED review clinic. So when it comes to the drop dead test, she has actually passed because you're kind of thinking, you know what? It's not a tumor in the knee. We've x-rayed the knee. It's not an infection because she's still around. And so she will be okay. So ED review clinic one week later. So one week later, uh, she's reviewed an ED clinic. And um, so the pain is better now. She says it's a bit better and I can put a bit of weight through. And the knee is once again examined um, and is found to have a, a good range of movement. But once again, when she extends it, it's painful. So that goes back to where actually when she's extending the knee, is it the composite movement of the limb and the hip movement that is happening, happening during terminal extension, which is called the pain. So she can still just about partially weight bear, advised keep the fracture clinic appointment. So what we'll see through these cases is that these children do come back to ED. They're not systemically well. They still have pain in a joint that the problem has been excluded through, you know, x-rays and then B, not really needing to do any tests for inflammatory markers because they're systemically well. But the yellow flag here is this child isn't getting better. You know, it's like a week down the line. They're not getting better. So fracture clinic appointment, they notice now that actually she's got fixed flexion formed in the knee, but they notice that she does not want to move her hip. You know, she, and when they try to passively move her hip, it's very painful. So an x-ray is done and she's got a severe Sufi. So when she tripped over that doorstop, um, her head came off uh, and that's why she was unable to wait there. And being unable to wait there is in a chubby child going into their teens with knee pain, always think Sufi. So the thing, the take home message from here is, is you know, knee pain, fat child, growth spur, physis is vulnerable, could the hip have slipped, get a hip X-ray, even if it's a mild slip, it will be reported on and a diagnosis will be made. You know, so you shouldn't think, oh, but you know, what if it's a really mild slip? I think the, the benefit to having x-rays is, is even I, you know, during my training, I've looked at an x-ray and said it's fine, only for a patient to be recalled after a radiology report. And that is the safety net. And sometimes I say that, I used to say that to patients when I would see them in ED, that I've looked at the x-ray and there's nothing to my eye, but it will get re be reviewed by radiologists. So the problem with the Sufi is, you know, is I've talked about what the precipitants are, but the important messages here are, is, you know, knee pain means hip pain, and if you see a fat kid who's had some trivial trauma and now can't walk on that leg, have a very high index of suspicion. And the sad fact is when you have a severe slip like this, so we pinned her hip, but you can see I've put the ice cream ball back on the cone and I've put some screws across, but the ice cream ball is looking a bit whiter and more sclerotic, a bit more dense than the other side, which tells me the bone is not turning over. And then inevitably, the fact that the bone isn't turning over signals that it doesn't really have much of a blood supply to behave like, a normal biological tissue so it progressively dies the hip collapses then you start to do heroic things like putting an external fixator to you know stretch this hip out stop it collapsing any further but sadly the attempt to salvage um is met with no success and she's got a severe degenerative hip uh, and this girl is i think now 12 or 13 and she's too young for a hip replacement you know so it's this is a life-changing diagnosis the mean payout for this diagnosis when it's missed. And I think in Nottingham, they have a case uh, which is um, has gone to litigation. And I think the payout is between 250 to 500,000.
uh, which is which is up there with cord requiner syndrome in terms of big payout for devastating impact on life. But we can see looking at this, like you know, the take home message here is about the well child, um, you know, systemically well child with uh, a limp where you know it's a knee pain. Um, and you've excluded problems in the knee, you know, and, and this is where like a simple, you know, no, having at the back of your mind, you know what, knee pain in a child, think hip, it, it would direct you to the hip. And then, you know, I think the, some assessment of the hip has been made in this case, but because diagnostic attention wasn't directed to it, you know, if it wasn't thought, actually, it is the hip, let me look at this hip and meaningfully examine it, thinking this is the source of the problems. And unless, you, you know, your attention is di directed there, when it's diverted by the knee, this is why this happens. And it doesn't just happen here, it happens everywhere. So severe degenerative hip, no simple reconstruction option. So I've talked about all the, the bad bits about these cases. So case two is 13-year-old boy, and he's got pain in the right knee. And he's never presented at ED before. And he was using an exercise machine at home. So they bought like, um, you know, a cross train and he was using that a few days ago. And now today he's got pain in his knee. There's no history of trauma and he can wait there. Um, so there's full range of movement, but there's pains at the extremes of flexion extension. So this is all I could garner from the notes really. Uh, I, there wasn't any mention of, you know, whether inquiry about general health systemic upset preceding symptoms and and often I feel with these is these are those sort of occult cases where the problem the problem that you're presented by the parents and the child is is almost like they give you the diagnosis on the plate look he was on an exercise we bought a new exercise machine a few days ago and he's been using it out and you know he's been using it now he's got knee pain so you know doctor I think the two are, are linked and you know then you go down that line you know the trivial trauma possibility of an injury you know and he's suspected to have a knee sprain because he could move the knee, I think they didn't do any x-rays at the time. Now, three days later, so this happened, I think, just for the weekend. They went down to Stevenage, uh, I think, to, to be with his dad. Um, and then whilst he was there, he went into septic uh, shock, really, uh, and was rushed to hospital and was found to have um, infection in his distal femur and, uh, you know, a knee full of pus. Um, his CRP was like 337 and the organism was PVL staph. Um, and I'm sure, as you'll all know, that PVL staph is a very, very, you know, uh, pathogenic, bad organism. It is an organ, you know, it does lead to ITU admissions and, uh, you know, children being on life support. And he needed four surgical washouts and he was there for two weeks and uh, he was transferred to LRI on day 14. Now, I saw them after this and judging by the time frame of, you know, when they presented with this knee pain and then the development of sepsis and the presence of osteomyelitis in the bone. And then, you know, it's ruptured into the joint because generally infections within bone, you know, they, they, they are contained, you know, osteomyelitis may just, you may just have a child who is fairly well and, you know, has got pain in the knee and they may not have obvious signs because, you know, the infection is all within the knee, but then it's just bursting to come out and then it does come out. So always have a, you know, a suspicion that, you know, any child you see, even if they've offered up, you know, if a trauma is offered up as the as the diagnosis that you think, well, actually, let me just think, could it be infection? So this is his x-rays and MRI when I saw him. Um, so his x-rays show the changes in the bone and the MRI changes persist for some time. And this child is still under follow up because the problem with these infections is they're very adjacent to the growth plate of the femur. And what they can do is they can damage that growth plate. And it's only evident often years later when you know they develop a growth arrest so this child had a proximal tibia osteomyelitis i think three or four years back uh, and an abscess and it was drained uh, and he was doing absolutely fine but then he went through his pubertal growth spurt and parents noticed his leg became bent and was short um, and these are difficult cases to uh, to treat because that you need to do some fairly comprehensive reconstruction um, and obviously parents are unhappy and they think it's a sequelae of you know something so this is infections they do they're not just problems for now, they do create problems for later. So case three, three-year-old boy, um, and once again, parents offer up, fell off a chair, fell off a chair, now he's got limp, and mum says, you know, he looks happy to you, doc, but he's holding his leg, and I see him dragging his foot, and he's completely well, and, uh, you know, when you see him, there isn't much of a limp, um, and he's had a few appendices in the last few years for, you know, tonsillitis and various other things, but nothing too serious, and at the end, you're left with a cumulative assessment of child who actually is not systemically well, you know, is not systemically unwell at all. He's got a bit of a limp, but he's giggling at you. 
and you can see well you know you can actually move the hip fairly well you haven't compared it with the other side or you know laid him prone but you think well actually if there was a problem he wouldn't be able to move it at all you know it, it wouldn't be subtle and i can see you can clearly move it so diagnosed with a superficial injury of the lower leg so six days later he returns uh, to ed he's still limping um, and they think well actually could it be a toddler's fracture so they x-ray his tibia and there is no bony injury so review in one week an ed review clinic um, so nine days later so over two weeks now from the original attendance um Mum tells you he had chickenpox after that first presentation. And it's and it's facts like this that really muddy the waters with kids often. You know, they're frequently getting little coughs and colds, they're falling over, and they can kind of warp your judgment. And then you think, well, actually, they had chickenpox. Could that have caused a reactive arthritis in their knee or their hip? It probably could have. And maybe that's why they were limping. And could there be some sequelae to that? And you think, well, actually, there could. And you look at them. And once again, he's smiling at you and he can run around and you do some functional tests because, you know, many of my colleagues, orthopedic colleagues, they, they do these functional tests with kids. And I'm thinking the problem is they're not sensitive. You know, you may have a restricted range of motion in your hip, but you can still run. You can still squat to a certain extent. You can still kick. So at this point, they continue with this diagnosis of maybe it was an occult injury or a transient synovitis, but the child is well. He's getting better. So we're going to review him in 10 days. So 10 days later, later. Um, Mum says it's actually, she thinks it looks a bit better, but when you, when the child runs, it's still there and you look at the gate and you make an assessment, the range of motion and you think, well, actually, you know, they can squat, they can kick, they can run. And there was that chicken pox and perhaps it's still the sequelae, you know, the irritable hip. And I think as with the first case we discussed, what should become a yellow flag here is the number of attendances. And I think once you start to, you know, it may be I, on reflecting on these cases, I think any, any, any reasonable doctor, you know, practicing safely could you know, make the same set of decisions. But I think when these cases are, are reviewed, I think what is looked at is that actually the number of attendances is now becoming a yellow flag, you know, and what that should prompt is a rethink, you know, but at this point, you know, diagnosis is irritable hip still there, discharged, and this child comes to ED another two times, you know. Eventually, three months after their first review, they're seen in ED review clinic, and I think at this point, it may be uh, depending on the practitioner um, involved, but they do an assessment of the hip movement and they notice that the internal rotation on that prone test, they lie, lie the children, child down and they see the hip does not, you know, the foot does not flop out the same way the other side does. And you get x-rays and what you see here is, is I think the ED doctor wrote in the notes, the head looks a little, epiphysis looks a bit smaller uh, and it looks a bit moth-eaten and I'll refer to orthopedics. And this diagnosis is Perthes disease. It happens in well children, it manifests with this cyclical pain and a limp due to the inflammation with the hip and this idiopathic avascular necrosis, which we don't really understand. Uh, but the reason Perthes disease is important is as this head starts to collapse, it does splurge out and become mushroom shaped. And it's still very controversial as to how you manage this, but here in Leicester, we believe that if you put the head into the joint very early on in the disease process before it's mushroomed, you've got the best chance of retaining its sphericity. And this is based on like obviously large international studies. Um, so this is a case of a 13 year old which uh, presented with early perthes and I quickly did this um, femoral break and reangulation and put the head in the acetabulum uh, to give it the best chance of not splurging out. Uh, but this surgery is time sensitive. You have to catch the disease during early process now sadly with this kid i think you know i saw him and i think if i saw him at that time point i listed him it i probably could have made the window um but i was i i looked at his young age and i thought it would be favorable um and i was actually cognizant of the fact that he'd been to ed several times uh, but i think i should have thought about that more that it's been going on for a long time and sadly when i saw him next six weeks later his head had already started to fragment um, and, and extrude, which means we've missed the boat. Uh, and the, on the x-ray on the right shows his most recent x-ray where you can see the head is really flattened. It hasn't fully healed. And we know the outcome from this is, is that he's going to have a flattened head and he'll probably have symptoms in his teens um, and he's going to struggle. He is going to struggle and likely need a hip replacement early on in life. So just like the Sufi, just like I mentioned about DDH, sadly, the important thing with these, these three hip conditions is timing has a bearing on outcome. So the sooner 
the suspicion arises and the sooner an x-ray is done, the sooner you are basically out of the woods when it comes to making the diagnosis. So case four is, uh, is actually not a hip, but I think this is a good one because uh, it's actually not from hair either, uh, but it highlights the importance of uh, not being distracted by the line of diagnostic inquiry that has been set out at previous visits. Um, so Asad, this, I'm yep. Asad, sorry to interrupt. Um, just, there was a question uh, from the audience about with Perthe, just before we move on to the shoulder, um, about, you know, it, could you, I suppose the question really is, how long does it take for you to start getting these changes on the hip? Because could you conceivably have a patient that's presenting with a bit of, you know, non-specific hip pain, but is well, but there's nothing on the x-ray, on an early x-ray, is that possible? Um, it, it is the... People have discussed whether there is a pre-radiographic Perthes disease. And if we go back to this original x-ray, I would argue that this is subtle. I would argue that only a pediatric orthopedic surgeon would look and recognize this or a radiologist and that an adult orthopedic surgeon would look at this and not quite know whether it was of significance. So my feeling is, is that as soon as it manifests clinically, a radiological diagnosis could be made and would be made by a radiologist. And it's not that these early cases of Sufi or Perthes that are mild and early on don't get missed by radiology. They do. You know, they do get missed there. And that's the other, that's actually the other, um, you know, point of like medical litigation is not, you know, what has happened in ED. Someone has rightfully requested an x-ray in ED, but then the radiologist has not reported it. So my, uh, the progress for Perthes can be very rapid. So, you know, the child, you know, when I saw this child, you know, they were referred to me at this point, and then uh, this x-ray was, I think, six weeks after I saw them. And within six weeks, it had progressed, and I'd missed the boat. So, uh, you know, I think, do not, uh, I would say that if they have symptoms, the diagnosis will be, can be made on x-ray for Perthes disease and Sufi and DDH, all three. Great, thanks for that, Asad. It was just important <laughs> to, yeah, to no, clarify. I think uh, these questions are really good because the problem is when you're in your own speciality, you have a real big blind spot, uh, which is you know the fact that you've got years of talking and thinking about this condition um, and you forget about fundamentals. So feel thank free. You. So this is the last case because uh, it's uh, been a long day. Um, so a four-year-old boy and he fell off a table at home a few days ago and he's been complaining of shoulder pain. Um, and they present to ED uh, and obviously shoulder pain fall you're thinking proximal humeral fracture it could be a green stick fracture it could be hard to pick up you're looking at this little divot here and you're thinking is that part of the tuberosity or is that a green stick angulation but x-rays are done it's felt possibly an occult fracture and he's put into a shoulder sling and he's sent home and then three days later he presents to the gp and the child is now unwell and feverish um, he's not been feeling well and uh, the shoulder is still painful and it's in a sling and no doubt the, the doctor will inquire oh What's happened to your shoulder? And they're like, oh, it's fallen off, fallen off uh, the table and uh, he's probably broken his shoulder. And GP thinks, no, oh, in then sling, okay. Um, what else could it be? Let's look at this child's tonsils. Tonsils look a bit unhappy. This is a photograph I pulled off the internet, not from this case. Um, and the GP thinks, you know, in this age group, you know, more than likely to be tonsillitis, oral antibiotics, off you go home. Um, a few days later, brought to ED in severe sepsis, uh, hypotensive, tachycardic, unres almost unresponsive, fast scan done, there's fluid around the pericardium, pericardiocentesis in ED, pus comes out, you know, very scary scenario, rapid transfer to Glenfield. Um, so Charlie is rapidly transferred to Glenfield and uh, is in PICU there, and they put a, a drain in and they drain pus from uh, the pericardium and Charles on uh, inotropes and support, sent for a CT scan, to look for the source within the thorax. Now, fortunately, the Glenfield is an adult site. So when they did the CT, the whole of the upper body of the child was included in the CT. And what the report said is, well, actually, there's nothing in the thorax, uh, but the shoulder looks pretty bad. And it looks like there's a lot of pus around the shoulder and the arm. And then the child was transferred to the Royal, uh, to ICU here. And, uh, and then I was called and uh, the pediatric radiologist discussed the case with the musculoskeletal radiologist. And they said, uh, effectively the whole shoulder capsule is full of pus. 
and the pus has leaked out around the rotator cuff. Uh, so it's basically all around the soft tissues of the shoulder. And it's also found that that space between the muscles at the back and now it's leaked into the posterior compartment of the arm. So under the triceps, the whole back of the arm is also full of pus. So this child has a massive bacterial load. We attempted to aspirate it in uh, ICU, uh, but we didn't really get anything back because uh, it was so thick and the decision was made, child is too unwell, too unwell um, to be given uh, to have surgery. So we need to optimize them. So next day I took it to theater and um, I did four approaches. So I approached the shoulder from the front, the back, the top, and I opened up the back of the arm because there's, there's that much pus and we had to be absolutely confident that we'd washed everything out um, because essentially it comes down to saving this child's life. Uh, and this is thankfully the one point in my career up until now where I can say I've I've done an intervention, um, you know, which which is life saving. Um, and a few months later, you can see there's massive changes in the bone around uh, with osteomyelitis, showing how extensive that pus collection was all around the glenoid, all around the scapula. Um, and thankfully, uh, he's those changes have resolved. He's still under follow up. He's got shoulder movement, uh, but he will have to stay under regular follow up. And, and I think that is a good case because I think, you know, it's very hard for us to take this case apart and say exactly what has happened. But you can see how. The shoulder, the shoulder presentation, the history of the trauma, you know, the diagnosis, putting it in a sling, and then, you know, that subsequently diverting, you know, the attention from the possibility that, you know, an unwell child when they present to primary care that the infection is in the joint. So, and it's, I, I, I'm absolutely, you know, uh, magnanimous and understanding and would not cast doubt on any colleague's practice, you know, in terms of, you know, was the assessment appropriate, uh, because these are all rare cases. And, and that's why, you know, the best of us will get caught out. But I think the take home message from all these cases is, is having that index of suspicion that, you know, trivial trauma, there is a history of trauma, it's been given to me, but could it be anything else? Should I just think about this and not let the parents derail my thinking into looking for another potential cause. Because often the parents will have this belief that, you know, they've had this trauma and I think it is that. Um, so questions, history is very important. Basic investigations you can do are very important. And I think especially with the hip conditions, early recourse to x-ray, you will not be sued for radiation exposure. Take it from me. I do lots of hip x-rays for surveillance, for hip dysplasia. And, you know, we've looked at, there've been studies which have shown if you follow up a child for hip dysplasia and you get four or five x-rays up to the age of four with modern ionizing radiation, the dosage they receive is less from those four x-rays is usually less than background radiation over one year. So have a very low threshold for a pelvic x-ray if you think there's something up with the hips. I think that's me done actually. Gosh, extended my time, uh, really eked it out there, uh, but I hope it was useful. Uh, and I'm more than happy to receive any feedback um, to, uh, you know, to tailor uh, the talk uh, for future.